next we're going to transition to our panel discussion and actually this is a perfect um, segue as we um, um, were talking about some of the challenges um, that well, we discussed both uh, during yesterday's uh, talks and today's talks. Um, so the panel um, is going to be um, moderated by Dr. Stephen Wong, who is also a member of the planning committee for this uh, summit. The first question for the panelists, what do you think are some of the barriers we face in the recruitment and retention of underrepresented minor, minority individuals? And perhaps you can touch on the lack of a robust pipeline or highway, the leaking out of students along the way, and the fact that there are no mentors or limited mentors that look like the students that we're trying to retain. So I open this up to the panelists. So, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of many, many problems. And it starts with the fact that um, essentially traditionally marginalized groups in the United States don't have access to the fundamentals that lead to the kinds of education that land you in medical school and then in residency fellowship and so on. And so I think the pipeline problem starts very early. And a lot of that is a legacy of uh, policies, segregation, and, and um, the like in this country, right? Um, many of these individuals are coming from neighborhoods that have been segregated. Much of the funding for education K through 12 comes from taxes from single family homes. And so, you know, the, the start of the pipeline program really starts there. And so I think when we think about how do we improve down the line, we really have to think about being politically active to dismantle the legacies of uh, those policies and programs. And then, you know, as we get through, we do have the leakage. And some of that is the fact that there are many other hurdles to overcome when you're a part of one of these uh, groups. Part of it is also what we think is excellent is centered heavily on whiteness, right? And so those, those teachers, those mentors see this person budding who might be able to go into these careers and, and they say, oh, that's not, that person doesn't look like a future doctor. I'm not going to invest my time there. I'm not going to make sure that this person gets a leg up. And we see that all through the pipeline, even here um, at, at the point where people are program directors and looking for someone to recruit into their programs. Thank you, Dr. Blazer. I totally agree with all that. Um, and uh, any of our other panelists? Dr. Wong, I, I think uh, the, the opportunity to mentor is, is tremendous. You know, as we think about our careers, as we think about careers of our colleagues and, and how we land in rheumatology and, and where we do, it's often strongly influenced by you know, someone who inspired us and someone who helped us and walked us along the way. And that really is, is a great point to what Dr. Blazer just said. You know, it, it's things that we can do individually in the one-on-one -on -one way that, that mentors and, and, and helps those who have dreams and aspirations to fully recognize those um, in an individual way. And so there's, you know, we often talk about mentor mentee and, and there are many wonderful examples of that. Uh, but, but I think there's an opportunity for all of us to, to magnify those efforts in, in what we do really on a daily basis and inviting folks in through pipeline, through uh, mentor, through research opportunities, through clinical opportunities to, to, to walk side by side and uh, of those to, to join the profession, the discipline, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. So mentor mentee opportunities, I think are just tremendous and, and have lots of great and positive returns. Awesome. And uh, I want to give the opportunity back to Dr. Akinchete because I think you're now maybe connected. Let's see. Hello. Yeah, there you are. We got you. Hey, okay. Sorry. <laughs> and, it, and it worked earlier. Um, yeah, no, I think one of the things also is just visibility. Um, I think early on, um, there's like a lot of um, people that talk about diabetes, cancer. You know, there's a lot of commercials. Like people don't even know what a rheumatologist is. So to even think that, um, that that's a possibility that, that you can become one, also it, it starts from the beginning. And then even throughout medical school, 
again, the visibility is rare. Like we only have maybe one lecture throughout medical school. And then again, during whether, you know, like during residency, um, internal resident, internal medicine residency or pediatric residency, um, you have to make an active effort to seek out these rotations. So for them, for us, for us as, you know, trainees um, to then have to find these mentors is very difficult. So I think in general, I think just having more um, of a visibility out there in general would be extremely helpful because I think that that is also, um, I think that, you know, like as Dr. Uh, Dr. Blazer mentioned, there's an access issue, but then, okay, once you have that access to even know that we exist is also an issue. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Great, that's perfect. Um, you know, I, as part of the, and we're currently in the season for, you know, recruitment of new fellows in our division, at least, and I'm sure across the country. Um, and, and sometimes when I look at uh, the evaluation forms that we have, and they're, they're based on forms that have been created 5, 10, 20 years ago, um, you know, they don't place a lot of, um, as another barrier to, to what we face in terms of recruitment intention of the underrepresented minority. It doesn't I, I don't see that in, in, in terms of where, where our evaluation forms have, you know, are trying to, to bring in uh, talents that are uh, in the underrepresented minors and that we can only add it in comments, but, you know, that doesn't come up with everybody that, that, are, that are being evaluators, um, that are interviewing, it, it doesn't really come up. So that, that may be another area that I can think of for a barrier. Um, uh, anything else from the panelists before we move on to the next question? Um, I just have one thing to add, and I think um, I agree 100% with what was already said specifically about visibility. And I think visibility both on the side of the clinician, but also on the side of the patient population. Um, and speaking from personal experience, I've noticed myself drawn to fields in which I feel as if I can actually serve my community. And just learning about the burden of rheumatological conditions in certain communities can help with um, recruitment to these fields. Very good, thank you for that. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, if I, I could add something really quick. I just wanted to Absolutely. echo everybody's comments. Very, very important. Um, and then I just wanted to add something about kind of the um, the leakage question too. Um, I think that there's a lot of focus on recruitment and not as much focus on retention as well and advancement into leadership for um, diverse people. Um, and I think that there's also not so much attention placed on things like um, the role of like constant microaggressions um, in kind of eroding people's um, uh, uh, wellness and leading to burnout, um, especially in the academic field. Um, and then also throughout all of this process, um, the burdens that often the dual or multiple burdens placed on um, disadvantaged or underrepresented people um, who are trying to like, make their way into um, this profession, like um, family burdens, uh, financial burdens, um, and, and um, things that often aren't uh, seen or made visible um, that um, are, are, are impactful as well. Um, and I think it's really important, like the visibility for sure, but also like formalized, tailored opportunities that, um, that specifically target the most underrepresented people and create those pipelines. Um, All right, awesome, Dr. Mantia. Okay, so on to the next question. What are some of the most common downfalls that you see in our interactions with colleagues and patients that are not congruent with DEI principles? Who would like yeah. to start? Uh, I, yes, I mean, Dr. Blazer, go ahead. Um, there are so many, right? There are so many. And I think, um, and many of these are embedded and many of these are just the ways that we think about our patients, right? Um, so, you know, we have conversations about things like health literacy or non-adherence. And really a lot of this is a breakdown in communication between physician and patient. Um, our patients are smart humans who want to get better, 
right? And I think that often when we are talking about people from minoritized groups, that patient physician interaction is very hurried, very rushed. And there are assumptions that are made often on the part of the physician about what a patient will accept, what they won't accept, what they can afford, what they can't, that what they won't be able to afford, what they can understand, what they won't be able to understand. And so that bias creates a difference in the way that we communicate with our um, patients from minoritized groups compared to other individuals. And so, you know, in rheumatology where we don't have accountability or even um, an outline of, of what to do with all of our diseases, it's very art of medicine rather than, you know, these are the treat to target guidelines for many of our diseases like lupus. Um, we end up relying heavily on our biased views rather than on a rubric of what should happen for every patient. And I think that our minor minoritized patients suffer disproportionately. Very good. Agreed. Oh, Ben, yes. Yeah, so I, I'll just share a couple of experiences here that maybe highlight and magnify um, what was said in, in the first answer, but I think helps us to answer this of, of downfalls. In the last number of years, um, so I, I work in a rural area clinically, and, and there are certainly underrepresented um, persons, uh, but also, you know, rural has tremendous access, and, you know, we have patients who drive hours to, to see us. And the realization came to me when I would talk to a couple of patients. We're, we're all compressed for time. We all have a short time to accomplish everything we're asked to do. But then patients would share with me, um, you know, they, they had to obtain car service, you know, pay 40 or $50 just simply to come and see me for transportation reasons. We're in an area where public transportation really just doesn't exist. Or patients would walk to their visit. And, you know, so I, I say and share this that they're just tremendous advocacy opportunities that we have. You know, we, we're all very active clinically and, and scientifically, but there's a, the other element or arm that we have here. And you know, so certainly this is a downfall for persons with, with chronic disease, rheumatic disease that we, we take care of. And it was just such a realization that, you know, as we now try to advocate within our community for those who we, we care for and, 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 and certainly have a high affinity to, um, it's the burden of the rheumatic disease, and part of that burden is, is is simply coming and walking through the doors of our clinics and such as that. And there's there's an opportunity here to 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 make a difference in perhaps a small way that may lead to to greater things. And um, so that just was such a realization. I can't say that I have perfect answers for any of that, um, but but I think it presents an opportunity where some headway is made, but there's so much more to to be done. Yeah, totally. Um, and uh, coming from a, an institution where we cover five states, the whammy states, um, and being the only children's hospital with pediatric rheumatology, um, it uh, I I echo that uh, that sentiment. We definitely need to find ways to recruit uh, and retain uh, rheumatologists uh, and, and rheumatology providers out into the rural communities. Um, and uh, slowly and surely, a couple of our fellows who we've uh, recruited in for training are from you know, uh, Montana and Alaska, and they plan to move back, so that may help. And we're, you know, perhaps adding telemedicine care may improve access. Uh, having funds for families, you know, if they're if if cost of gas, well, we all know gas is <laughs> cost is rising. Um, all all that. Well, hopefully we can add to it. But yes, absolutely, uh, Ben. The I will echo that part with the transportation concerns. Um, yeah, yeah I just Matthias. wanted to uh, add to like I think that one of the one of the big um, impetuses for me to go into rheumatology besides it being an awesome specialty and and um, the patients being amazing and the pathology being amazing um, is that as a field rheumatology has kind of lagged behind in a lot compared to a lot of other 
um, medical specialties and acknowledging the importance of DEI and really being reflexive um, and critically appraising how we talk about our diseases and how we um, support our patients. Um, like if you, I think there's been in the last one to two years, a lot of more interest in this. And, um, you know, if you look at the rheumatology education literature, um, we still are, are very much having the le living legacy of racism and sexism um, and promoting ideas about racialized medicine. Um, things conflating race and genetics is very common um, in rheumatology, whereas in other subspecialties, um, there's a greater recognition that those two things are not related. Um, and also the, you know, I'll give you an example. I was just at a um, one of our um, uh, meetings and we were talking about, you know, I brought up the need for in research, um, like a DEI champion and to really make sure that um, diverse patients are not just represented in research, but also um, there's a focus on on justice for those patients because we, the legacy of medicine, and especially here in this country, is that yes, um, uh, as, uh, patients of color have been um, victimized and and um, a lot of unethical research has gone on. So they have been represented in research, but not in the right ways. And, um, and I guess um, what ended up happening was the person I was talking to um, was saying, well, our lupus biorepository has a ton of representation because we have a ton of Black and Latinx bio samples. And I was like, that's not the rep representation I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, representation of the patients um, in what are they getting out of those bio samples? What are they what are they getting out of what they're giving? And I think that this connects a lot to what Dr. Blazer was mentioning too, is that um, there is not just perception, but a reality that um, that patients, underrepresented patients and uh, marginalized patients um, are constantly being extracted from, utilized, and not getting any benefit from what we're doing as scientists, as physicians, as rheumatologists, as clinicians. Um, and I think that that is really important to, um, to acknowledge. And then I think also there was, uh, uh, maybe in the last five years, there was um, a survey research um, that looked at rheumatologist perception of our patients um, and that um, like I think 70% of those surveyed didn't think that um, um, discrimination was important or, or um, that it was, it was just like a health education, health literacy issue um, or language issue. Um, and I think that we need to recognize as a specialty, the importance of unmet social needs for our patients and the importance of these social structural, um, um, sorry, it's early in the morning here in Seattle, but these social structural um, forces that are, are, are overarching and causing our patients to, to experience um, these disparate outcomes. Thank you for adding that. That's very powerful uh, in terms of the, the data uh, and uh, well, yeah, well said, well said. Any others who would like to comment? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add just on the other end, because there are interactions where the physicians are very well intentioned, very well informed, and sometimes there are um, perceptions also from the patients that the physician um, somehow is doing something wrong. So also recognizing um, when the patient physician interaction goes awry and a way to fix it. Um, that's like uh, work from Dr. Christina Gonzalez, where they, you know, the patient comes in with their own perceptions and so do the providers and being able to pick up when the um, actual relationship goes awry, there's a way that you can either apologize or explain. For example, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. Um, I am also a pediatric rheumatology patient. Um, I was in significant pain um, from joint pain and um, the provider, I was very upset and thought that the provider was giving me um, minimal pain medication because they thought like I was a pain seeking black patient. But now knowing that's not the case, I am a pediatric rheumatologist and we don't give oxycodone or Percocet or any of those pain medications. But to me, my perception was she was you know, like that she was, you know, that she was stereotyping me. Um, so just coming in and knowing where these 
relationships and understanding and recognizing when these, and, and I know that this um, provider was very well intentioned. She's amazing. Um, but knowing when these actual, uh, these interactions go awry can be very helpful also um, in picking up and noticing um, and, you know, and, and, and understanding the patient a little bit better. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because I know, you know, there are structural aspects and policies that are in place that are attributing to all of these disparities, but also when physicians are well-intentioned and informed, there are still times that this can go awry and just understanding when that can happen can also um, help is what I also want to yeah, that, that's very astute. I can I can think of yeah multiple times that's happened to me and had to uh, try to correct that uh, interaction or my errors. Um, not specifically just my errors, but like just the interaction between myself and my patient. So I, I fully understand that. Um, and uh, Shakur, if you want to add anything else, uh, you don't have to. I, can, I, can always... I guess just to add one point, I'm kind of focused on the potential downfalls if we go too far on the other side with the DEI initiatives and us like perpetuating this idea of that we as somebody who may not share the background of our patients are not able to as effectively connect. And I think if that is the idea that we promote, then we run harm to the doctor-patient relationship. Um, and I guess to make it more tangible, if I as an African-American female have a patient who may be a Caucasian male and I, my first thought is the difference that we share. And I immediately seek out somebody who may share the ethnical um, connection. And I think I run a risk of not being able to connect with my patient as effectively. And I think as we move forward in this space, we always have to remember, regardless of what our differences are, we have more in common. And if we always keep that at the front of our minds, I believe we'll be able to serve our patients regardless of whether or not we share these minute details as far as I'm also African-American or I'm also female. Yes, very, very great point. That's that's something we should really keep in mind as well, the, the other aspect of what we do in DEI, absolutely. All right, I have some great discussions so far. Hopefully you guys are all thinking critically as you're listening and adding some questions, um, but we still have another question. Uh, so what does success look like? I know we may have touched upon that a little bit in the, the previous talks, but what has been done to show that DI principles uh, being upheld when hiring and training medical professionals have affected health outcomes? I open up to the panelists. I mean, I, I don't know if, yeah, and Dr. Blazer can also attest to this, but um, coming in as a Black Dominican pediatric rheumatology fellow in the Bronx, um, there were certain patients um, that were not coming to visits, not coming to appointments. And because I was recruited in the Bronx, they started coming to their appointments. They felt heard. They didn't feel that they were discriminated against. They and not to say that they were, but it's just that feeling. So knowing that we were able to help these patients that were in particularly high risk, um, at you know high risk of, you know morbidity and mortality, um, with like high disease activity, we were you know able to basically decrease that risk because they're now coming to their appointments as like I mentioned, a black, because they were connecting to me as a black Dominican physician. So just in that one aspect, um, I was able to help many patients in in that particular practice. So I think there's a, you know, you know, I, I do want to, for Shakura, I think that it's important to also just remember that there is a big importance of having um, concordant care. Um, not to say that disconcordant care is um, not gonna be effective, but particularly when patients feel that they're being discriminated against and that there is racism in the system, I think having someone, a physician that they feel that is advocating for them um, is beyond helpful and that they will continue to come to their appointments, take their medications um, and seek the appropriate care. So um, 
I think I, that's one of the points I wanted to make. And if I can uh, press a little further, did you ever feel like when your when your patients came from um, you know in the Bronx area and uh, the the minorities came more often when you started coming like you were recruited, did you get a sense that there was a concern for you know these patients not feeling like they were heard or there was a disconnect? Between yeah, I specifically providers? asked. I specifically asked. <laughs> I said, "Oh, why are you why are you coming back now?" Um, and I actually. Um, wrote a like kind of like a opinion piece with one of the patients um, who was getting her MPH about how she felt. Um, so it, it is, it, and, and it might be something small, like there was a, a, a mom who felt that because the provider was asking constantly about mental health, that they thought that they weren't providing in the home, that, um, you know, she had to make sure that she said that she had a husband, she had to make sure that she said, she had a job to make sure that the physician took her seriously. You know, like these small details that like, you, you know, that the provider wouldn't even think, you know, like a, someone of another race may not have thought of, um, that people come in to these appointments trying so hard to make sure that they're heard. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, I, I did specifically ask, you know, I wanted to know specifically. Um, so there, there are a lot of um, small details that might not be picked up with a disconcordant um, care. So I, ju I just wanted to also point that out, that it is, I think, very important. Um, since there is so much that it's going against all of these patients that we have providers that are really advocating for them. Thank you for giving that example. Okay. Anyone else? Um, <clears throat> not from the patient side, but from kind of the recruitment side, I just wanted to add, which I totally agree with um, what Dr. Afonsete was saying, but um, also like I wasn't sure that I was going to pursue rheumatology and I was able to take advantage of our institutions here at UW um, visiting scholar programs specifically for um, underrepresented medical students that allowed me to come here, work in our county um, hospital um, see rheumatology in action. And really that was my, you know, kind of like foundational um, experience that crystallized my desire to continue to pursue um, this pathway. And then now here I am as a fellow, <laughs> like four years later. And then also now I'm also working with uh, an underrepresented Latinx medical student who is in my same position um, four years ago and getting her publications, getting her into conferences, mentoring her research project. And that to me is what success looks like, is like continuing to pay it forward and funneling these um, specific dedicated pipeline programs. And I think that um, that is going to be really important um, going forward. Absolutely. And that's why we have these uh, summits to try to improve and advance the uh, our DEI initiatives um, and to hopefully just yeah get to that place. Um, yeah. I would say as far as what is what a success look like, I um, I really actually didn't know about these Arthritis Foundation grants for DEI projects. Um, but I think that's part of what success looks like, right? So I think to Shakur's point earlier, we all are interested in serving our own communities. And I think the patient population allows for that. A lot of us don't know that as physicians, we think rheumatology, arthritis, old people, you know, we're not going to, you know, there's a whole spectrum, right? Um, and I think because a lot of the grant money out there is for, translational research. And it's, I mean, I'm a translational researcher. I think that that's important, but like things like education, mentorship, improving the pipeline, you know, meta ed tracks. It's really difficult for our academic institutions to invest in those because there's not funding for it. Right. Um, physicians who want to do that are, are not able to buy out their time with grant money very well because our institutions are not putting the funding there. So I think having specific grants that improve that aspect of academic medicine will be important because 
we know that people from traditionally minoritized groups want to do that work. We do that work for free. That's what the minority tax is, right? And so if we can start um, incentivizing and valuing the work, I think that we start seeing big changes in our field. Great comment. I do wonder if from the educational side, educational grants, uh, I mean, our Thrust Foundation is great, um, but if we can like find other and maybe perhaps it's one of these things where DI is just becoming more uh, in the forefront that there may be interactions between different organizations and institutions where we will have more grant support. Um, but we do need to find ways to advertise. I'll just use, you know, send out the word that these grants are out there uh, and, and, uh, and really work on the problem. Um, so, yes, thank you, for Dr. Blazer, for that comment. Dr. Wong, if I could share yes. a few thoughts too that I hope complement everything that's been said which has been eloquently stated um I'll share an experience and then I'll share um maybe two suggestions as we think about success um earlier this year I was attending a similar session like this on diversity equity and inclusion and it was a powerful session that was facilitated and the speaker who was so again I'll use sort of eloquent um, help me to understand that diversity and equity, I, I, I might think about those as nouns, perhaps. But when he stated that inclusion was a verb, uh, that, boy, my, it just was so enlightening to, to me. And so I, I think success will mean that, that we've done things that, that have wonderful and great outcomes. And that was, again, again personally, that, that made a difference for me. So we all want to be active. Um, our institution for many years has, has reached out to even at a middle school age level uh, to uh, you know, those who may have an opportunity or may be thinking about a health career or may never have considered a health career at all, but to have, if you will, interaction with those who are health care providers. And then that moves into the high school years and it moves into the undergraduate years of, of college as well to, to, to follow that individual along that path. And there's been success of persons going to medical school and, and, and going to healthcare professional schools as well. And, and so at an educational level, an institutional level, that can occur. A second example is um, we have begun to develop a relationship with an HBCU in our community. Now, I must say it's evolving, um, but through a shared uh, student experience, uh, they've, they've joined us in, in, in courses, undergrad courses that are exploratory and introductory to you know, health career, career uh, potential and opportunities. And, and, and there've been a number of those students who now have applied to health professional schools. Um, and so again, that's a story still being written. And so I, you know, I think the reach extends beyond um, you know, when someone applies and, or is applying to medical school. Let us look to perhaps earlier in, in someone's life and, and informative time of thinking about what, what can be done. The other thing I would share with you, we're all really wanting to be successful in, in DEI and, and um, you know, to, with patients, with our colleagues, with, with those whom we interact with on a daily basis. And, you know, as a, as a non-physician, as a, as a health professional, I, I think let us recognize the opportunity that we have in our teams, in our, in our, in our interprofessional teams um, to um, reflect and represent and reach out to patients you know, with other members, health professional members who are expert in, in certain things, you know, our rehab uh, colleagues, our uh, behavioral mental health colleagues, even our administrative colleagues, that um, you know, this, uh, this desire to be successful, you know, should extend to the whole team. And let's get everyone on board, um, you know, in terms of representing who we are and, and what we do. Um, it's not meant that any of us do this alone, uh, but you know, truly as an interprofessional team, uh, we can have success and, and, you know, in individual ways reach persons that we serve um, so beautifully. And uh, so I think that's an opportunity as we think about this uh, potential for success and, and how we will be effective 
uh, in, in all these things that we've, we've discussed the last two days. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, absolutely. The whole, we, we may not have touched as much, and I'm sure we can spend another hour or two just talking about the multidisciplinary team and how that can, you know, no support um, besides, you know, recruitment into that team uh, of minorities, but also um, just how we can use that team to support our patients as well. So absolutely. And one thing I wanted to add uh, from the perspective of the Arthritis Foundation is that we do, uh, obviously, our primary stakeholders and organizations are patients, and we do serve patients who have the autoimmune inflammatory forms of arthritis, but also patients with, let's say, osteoarthritis. And that's a very uh, large portion of a very diverse. Uh, population that is actually seen not uh, to uh, to your point, Ben, is seen mostly uh, by um, not necessarily a physician first, but other type of healthcare professionals. So that's where the again importance of multidisciplinary team approach and and then having diversity on all the teams and then also having this as part of the training. Is, is is very critical. Um, so, and then the other point I wanted to make is that, and we're going to talk a little bit after the panel about this, is that when we convened the um, DEI working group at the Arthritis Foundation, we were aware that there were a lot of other organizations, obviously funding initiatives in the area of DEI, but we wanted to uniquely find things that maybe other organizations have not supported and think about how we can take a more uh, multi-institutional type of approach. Of course, we started out with individual investigator awards first in order to grow the program, but we definitely see and hear constantly the need for this type of funding source and incentivizing the collaborations between institutions that are a little bit more um, well resourced with others that may not be in order to you know generate the types of collaborations that serve all patients best and also the other thing that we try to um, hear from you is how we can best engage the patients and have them help um, kind of shape some of those initiatives through their own feedback and lived experience and you know just contribute to what they think is most valuable so that's kind of the thought process that has gone behind some of the discussions that we've had um, on shaping the initiatives and then also you know doing some smaller programs and pilot projects and then seeing what's successful and with small funding support can make a big difference so really looking at kind of how to make impact with obviously limited resources. So that's another thing that always is taken into consideration as we can, uh, as we start to think of where to have impact. And I think we have a comment. So I'll get myself on mute. And then please for the uh, audience, we, we do hope that this will be an interactive discussion, not just among the panelists, but also with the audience. So uh, we hope that you can put some of your questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for that. I believe Dr. Akinchete has a uh, hand up. Yes. Sorry, I, um, I just wanted to also, uh, so one point that I also wanted to bring up that I think is really important is that we use actually our, particularly in pediatrics, our patient population as a workforce. Um, as I mentioned, a, I was a pediatric rheumatology patient and I am now a physician. Several of us that were from that practice are in nursing or another one's a social worker. Um, so there's a lot of potential. Um, one of the patients from Montefiore was interested in medicine. She is now um, in participating in um, pre she she's a biology major and she participated in many pre-med programs that i helped her find so a lot of there's a lot of opportunity because they have clearly the ambition the passion um to now want to find a cure to help the community 
Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity with our patients. Um, so if there's like a, you know, some type of scholarship or some way to now help them, um, you know, uh, find programs, um, I think that that would be extremely helpful. But that was one way any patient that said that they were interested in medicine, I pointed them to different programs for their level um, and several of them applied. So I think that that is a great resource and they would have the great, the most, they would be the most compassionate providers um, for their patients. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's great. And actually at the Arthritis Foundation, we do have a college level award for our GA patients that they can apply for. And I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's not a large amount of funds, but we do give out at least 10 every year. And it's really exciting to read some of the applications and there's definitely more that I'm sure can be done at the next step of transition after college into medical school for sure. So thank you for that comment. I, I really appreciate Maria's comment and how she helps us to focus here. I, I, you know, we, we're gathered today because we all have, regardless of what our day-to-day -day efforts are, the, the focus on patient care. And that's really the sum. And that's what success will look like is optimum patient outcome, maintaining function and so that's so well said, and I just I would just echo that. It really punctuates uh, what we're what we're doing. That that's just beautiful, just excellent. Thank you. So, the, are, are there any um, questions from the audience? I want to make sure we give everybody a chance if they would like to ask any of our panelists for any um, comments. That um, you have a, an opportunity if you're. A, labeled as a panelist, you can get yourself off of mute or um, enter something into the Q&A. Um, because we're flexible on time and we can certainly at some point transition to the next point of the agenda, but we did want to keep, um, I think I see a hand up, Andy. Yeah, hi, thanks for all the comments. It's all very important, very helpful. I learned lots of things today as well as yesterday. Maybe can each of the panelists um, think about and, and maybe provide us with some guidance of if there was one thing you wanted the Arthritis Foundation to do going forward, what would it be? Only get one. Teach holistic review to fellowship directors. Um, yeah, I, I just, sorry, I guess to explain it a little bit, I mean, again, I think a lot of the metrics that we have for who would be successful and who wouldn't in fellowship are centered on whiteness. It's like, you know, what were your test scores? Have you rotated with this famous person? Have you done research with that person? Have you published in this journal? You know, all of those things are, uh, are going to, uh, correlate most with access, right? Um, especially at the point that someone is a trainee, we know that trainees can only do so much for these projects, right? And so it's not like they're, it, it's that they had access to someone who allowed them to be on this project, or they went to great schools that are also segregated products, right? So like they benefited from segregation in the, in the education system. And then we further, um, uplift those individuals. And so I think when we're talking about making sure that we're having a healthcare workforce that serves everyone, then we need to make sure that our metrics are not centered on the same things that caused the exclusion in the first place. You can imagine if our metrics were, we think someone who's a first generation doctor has a lot of grit. And we think that someone who had to work through um, medical school and college really has a great work ethic. And also HBCUs have been a pillar of our American education. So we're going to take people preferentially from Howard and Spelman. We would probably have a lot different, you know, population. But we say exactly that on the side of, um, of, of white individuals, right? Like these schools that have traditionally taken mostly white people who, you know, have done multiple um, uh, extracurriculars that white individuals usually do um, tend to be more likely to be selected. 
And so I think we really need to change the way that we are selecting individuals because we are going to systematically exclude and then we'll say, well, why don't we have anyone? Yeah, thank you for this point. I just wanted to mention that yesterday, um, to that point, there were two examples we heard about. One was from the a speaker earlier this morning, Lisa Kershiani Schreiber. I think she took some time during, I think it was the panel discussions to um, read off at Duke before the fellowship review, a statement that they have written that they share with all reviewers to remind them about implicit bias. And um, it, it was a fairly lengthy statement that she really wanted to read because she thought it has changed the, the way people look at some of the factors. And even though they may have changed the criteria, they still felt it was important to even give it like right before the review and make people review the statement again. And again, I'm, um, since she's not with us anymore, I just wanted to paraphrase that in some extent. So that was one example. And of course, the other one that was suggested um, by Gail Kerr during the discussion on HBCU history was the one about second look for underrepresented minority applications. So I was wondering within your institutions if that is a practice that is currently being employed or not. So because she was saying that obviously that's one recommendation that she had for how we could try to enforce a little bit more um, thoughtfulness around decision making. So, so currently, the any institutions represented here, they're not in applying that kind of process in their review. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, thank you for the comment. Um, and I want I didn't want to interrupt the other panelists if they had um, additional points because we definitely want to take those down. <laughs> Um, I think for me, I would say there's one thing which would be really hard to pick. Um, I would love to see a national visiting scholar program um, specifically for pre-med medical students or residents that focuses specifically on um, Black, Native, or Latinx student trainees that allows those students to go and do an away rotation or a clinical experience with rheumatologists. Um, and provides um, funding and support for them. I guess I'm not a panelist, but I'm a moderator, so I get to I get to talk. Uh, so um, uh, I was a Arthritis Foundation fellow. My my fellowship, pediatric um, uh, rheumatology fellowship, was funded by the Arthritis Foundation. So really thankful for that. Grateful. Um, but to speak further on that, um, if I could ask them like one thing, um, to they're going to continue to support fellowship training, which is great. Uh, but perhaps keep in mind uh, to include the uh, maybe as a criteria as underrepresented minors uh, be a part of that, more so specifically on the part of recruitment of uh, international medical graduates. As myself, I'm not an American citizen. I, I did have roadblocks to trying to find um, uh, institutions that would um, accept me as an applicant because I couldn't apply for NIH grants. Um, and so funding is an issue for fellows. Uh, and so to limit the, uh, or to try to decrease the barrier for international medical graduates to train, here and retain here. Um, hopefully, the Arthritis Foundation grants may, um, uh, uh, fellow grants may help out there. I, I think I'll, I'll add the um, in all the good that's being done through, by the Arthritis Foundation and, and all the initiatives, all the activities. You know, con continue to remember the entire interprofessional team in those opportunities, in those opportunities for activity as supporters of all the great and wonderful work. Uh, you know, I, I think that's that would be my one, uh, just ask for continuance. Of. Um, in the same vein of talking about also using our patients, I think that, um, I think that it would be amazing if we were able to create um, some, like in an aspect of a virtual um, summit like this, 
or a virtual um, uh, class, you know, like a few lectures here and there that can be done um, internationally as a, because it's not going to be a pathway program per se, but I think if there are summits in particular for um, patients and um, patients that are interested in medicine, but also just middle school, high schoolers, anyone, um, just to show interest. Because uh, one thing that I found that was really powerful was a high schooler um, who listened to one of, you know, talk about rheumatology, you know, understand rheumatology. And he then went further on and actually went to go um, learn about Cornell rheumatology and actually went to a conference of theirs. Um, so I think just starting early with exposure, um, whether it's through these pre presentations, through virtual summits, um, and just having resources available for the, 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 um, the, you know, the students that are interested. So I think just like having summits like this, that at least shows our visibility, um, uh, on our website saying like, hey, this is what, pe you know, rheumatology is, um, come learn about it. Here are a few panelists discussing this. Um, and then, you know, just having resources to point them in the right direction because they may be a high schooler, they may be a, um, you know, medical student, just having resources to then point them in the right direction. But I think just visibility is important. Yeah, great. Thank you. And actually, to, as a follow up question, I wanted to ask if we were to reach out because there were a lot of comments earlier about medical school students. And again, this visibility issue. Let's say we were to try to reach a medical school audience. Any ideas specifically of what might be successful, especially from your own personal lived experiences with that type of audience of like what, what kind of Obviously, we can develop some sort of webinar con content where even some of you as practicing physicians or when you're a fellow pursuing a degree could come and speak. But in, in addition to that, are there any other type of um, outreach efforts that you think at the medical school level would be um, effective? I mean, I think um, one of the speakers spoke about it earlier, but... Um... LMSA, SNMA, those organizations would be really important to do one of those presentations. Um, you know, like to get a table there is expensive, but if the Arthritis Foundation could be there um, and, you know, one of us, you know, someone does like what is rheumatology, <laughs> I think would be very helpful. But I think just visibility is important in doing either like a a webinar series, something like that, that I think can reach many people. Um, and then just making sure that we provide a way for them to reach out, whether it's through email, point them to the right directions, to resources. Um, but yeah, I think visibility is important. And I wanna give Shakura an opportunity to answer Dr. Chan's question as well uh, on one of the changes uh, for the Arthritis Foundation. Oh, sure. Um... I guess to answer the question before, I think continuing in the same vein of what you guys are doing, and this kind of goes back to the earlier question of what the success look like. And in my view, it's like a two way street. Um, if you want to know if you've been successful, what are, who is it that you're trying to serve and what is their perception of how effectively have you served them? And I kind of see that in what you guys are doing now, just through this summit here. Um, you guys have goals that you're trying to reach and you're reaching out and you're investigating to see what are the things that the residents, the students, the current fellows have to offer regarding this idea of success as the Arthritis Foundation. And I think continuing in that vein and whatever the efforts are, whether it's engaging with um, medical schools, um, increasing visibility at conferences, I think continuing to like, look at this idea of success as a two-way street and trying to receive information as well as give things, um, I think you guys will be successful. That's great. Uh, and actually, I want to read one of the, there was a question yeah. in, because it really will link well into what you just said, Shakur, um, uh, that um, for some reason went under answered. 
Uh, but I wanted to make sure that the panelists all have a chance to weigh in on that since we have a few minutes. What are your ideas on how the Arthritis Foundation can engage the local patient communities in DEI efforts and awareness? And that goes to the two-way street. And so if you have any suggestions of how you can help us, is, uh, you know, since you engage with those patients, but also how you think we as an organization can engage the communities. And this is a question um, by Dr. Tanya Horton, um, who is a volunteer and is leading a lot of our the uh, initiatives um, at the foundation that are not within the science portfolio, but um, I, I'm sure she would love to hear from, um, and I think maybe there was one written answer, but I still think we should discuss this group uh, verbally as well. Maybe Dr. Mantia, you can start since you uh, offered an answer and maybe you can expand on it. Yeah, um, I was just saying that, um, in addition, I think patient representation is really important at all levels. So um, I'm sure the Arthritis Foundation has a has a track record of including patients on their leadership and advisory councils. But um, one of the things as a sociologist um, that I think would be really cool, and um, I think it speaks also to what Dr. Blazier was saying earlier about um, the lack of funding um, for um, some of the disparities work that isn't translational um, is to see uh, like a grant mechanism focused specifically on community-based participatory research, which is a model that really centers um, patients and their um, not just as stakeholders, but as leaders in the research um, and really directing research um, efforts um, at um, outcomes that are important to them and their lived experiences. And I think that that would be really integral for inequity. Um, and I would love to see that um, in um, the arthritis rheumatology space. Um, I think I, I totally agree with that. And I also think that patient stories are extremely powerful. I, I, I keep coming back to this point, um, Shakur, that we do not, you know, when we think about cardiology and GI, you know, there are these campaigns about colon cancer being something that disproportionately affects um, people of color or breast cancer um, for oncology or, you know, and I think that we do not do a great job of highlighting the fact that these rheumatic diseases disproportionately affect these communities. And I think a patient's story can be so poignant and that can be uplifted and um, advertised, right? And I think not only does that get patients involved, but it also gets community dwelling individuals who might be interested in medicine thinking about the fact that you can serve your community if you do this specialty. And so I think partnering with patients would be an extremely powerful way to do that. Thank you. Well, that's quite a great way to um, maybe wrap up this part of the discussion. Uh, we're going to take a really thank you so much for uh, wonderful comments and very insightful suggestions. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we'll probably be reaching out to you um, as a follow-up to this meeting to make sure as we start designing some of the initiatives. Mm -hmm.